Aloha, my name is Samuel Wilder King II. I am the Executive Director of Imua TMT. I am joined here today with James Stone, Peter Poe, and Kalepa Bayan to discuss defining sacred and the sacredness claims of the Kia'i or protesters on Mauna Kea and what that means for our community and what it means for all of us in Hawaii. And we want to talk today about everything around that topic, around the separation of church and state, about the importance of cultural claims and the importance of respecting religious identity and religious claims. So without further ado, I will introduce our three panelists. Uh, Mr. Stone is a Hawaii attorney with 30 years of experience who practice focuses upon the representation of real estate companies, trade associations, and risk management. He has written 15 certified real estate continuing education courses, over 40 real estate related training manual, manuals, and well over 100 real estate related articles covering a wide range of topics. Regarding Hawaiian culture, Mr. Stone is an accomplished musician and hula practitioner who was trained by Winona Beamer and Henry Mulkeha Pa. Mr. Stone has recorded five CDs and has been nominated for three Nahoku Hanahano Awards. In 2008, he won the Hoku for Album of the Year for Nalani Eha as co-producer and recording artist. Additionally, he was president of the Hawaiian Music Hall of Fame from 2004 to 2016. Welcome, Jim. Aloha. Aloha. And next we have Peter Apo. Peter Apo is the president of the Peter Apo Company LLC for a business planning and consulting consult, uh, company. He was a Hawaii state legislator for 12 years. He's the director of arts, culture and arts for the city and county of Honolulu under Mayor Harris. He was also the director of Waikiki Development under Mayor Harris. He was a special assistant on Hawaiian affairs to Governor Ben Cayetano. He was elected to the first OHA board of trustees in 1980 to 82 and re-elected to OHA again in 2010, serving until 2016 or 18? 18. 18. 18. And continues, he continues to serve on countless boards and commissions, and he's continued to do that, and he's been doing that for over 50 years. Last but not least, we have Chad Klepapabayam, Born and raised in Lahaina, Kalapa Bayan has been an active participant in the Polynesian voyaging renaissance since 1975. Kalapa has served as captain and navigator on board the iconic Hawaiian double-hauled con voyaging canoe Hokulea, as well as the canoes Hawaii Loa and Hoku Alaka'i. In 2007, he was one of the five Hawaiian men initiated into the Order of Po, a 3,000-year-old society of deep-sea navigators by their teacher, master navigator, Mao Pialo, on the island of Satawa. Kalapa has served as Imi Loa's first navigator in residence since his appointment in 2009. Kalapa most recently participated in the three-year Malama Honua Worldwide Voyage of Hokulea. He returned to school late in life, graduating with a BA from Kahaka Ula e o Kehe Leo Kalani College of Hawaiian Language in 1997 and followed with a master's in education from Heritage College. So thank you all for being here. Welcome. And I want to jump right into it. Just, you know, this topic clearly is of great importance to our community, to our society, maybe even to the whole world. Everybody is paying attention to this. So I wanted to give you a chance to offer your initial thoughts on this topic, defining sacred and, you know, Mauna Kea and TMT. So, Ima, why don't we start with you? My observation is that for, for most of my life, and I am 63 years old, uh, Mauna Kea and the uh, scientific use of Mauna Kea and telescopes on it have been viewed positively by our community, by our community, I mean the Hawaiian community, is a relatively recent mm -hmm. development that Hawaiians are at least perceived by the larger community as being against uh, scientific uses of Mount Kea. And this is particularly heartbreaking for me because I know many of the people in, in the movement and I understand the impact that this will, will have for our people. As you know, TMT uh, presents the, the most important uh, astrological tool uh, that's even contemplated. It reaches, it's essentially a time machine that reaches back uh, hundreds of millions of, of years. And its development is not only a, the telescope itself, but also the educational support for Native Hawaiians. A hundred some odd uh, scholarships uh, for Hawaiians every year for the next 10 years plotted out. It is the future 
of the general community and the scientific benefits that we can get for it, but also the direct impact it has upon Hawaiians. And the, the claims of sacredness uh, currently been leveled are really, uh, I think as we talk about it more, personal in nature. And it is very difficult to draw a, a, a through thread back to uh, what was sacred to Hawaiians uh, pre-contact. Thank you very much. Peter, why don't we go to you? What are, you, what are your opening thoughts? Well, first of all, uh, aloha and, and thank you uh, all both and Kalepa on the Big Island for uh, opportunity for me to join you folks. Uh, you know, my observation uh, generally comes from my 40 plus years of public service. So I, I bring an eye toward the impact on public policy here, which uh, runs a, a whole range of issues. And what's been particularly interesting to me, and when this issue was first raised in around 2015, the, you know, the first little bubbling under of the volcano, um, it was specific to the TMT. Everything was focused on, T, on 30 meter telescope. Since then, the, the two, three year break that they took to go to court and to fight the legal battles, there have been other issues that have slowly been bubbling under. This time around, it's very different. The volcano seems to have like exploded and it sent down the mountainside several lava flows, all of which uh, represent different issues. So the issue has expanded. Uh, to a wide range of issues, uh, a lot of it triggered by the, uh, by the blocking of the road. So you have things like, uh, first of all, uh, really important, validating, which we're going to get more into when we get into body, validating the cultural claim of uh, Mauna Avakea. You get into the separation of church and state uh, based on the sacredness uh, claim. You get into the rule of law that is preventing people from going to work and uh, an officially approved project by the government, you get into a very divided Hawaiian community. And while the optic may be through because of the, 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 the more friendly nature of the media to the protectors and the kiai, you get this optic that all Hawaiians, as Kimo mentioned, you know, are anti-TMT, and that is not true. Uh, we're pretty heavily divided on this. Um, one of the more foreboding, I think, impacts that I'm beginning to feel and to sense uh, is that this is something that's beginning to divide Hawaiians from the rest of Hawaii. And when I say that, what I mean is that there have been issues before, but you know, we've always pretty much had the support of all of Hawaii, uh, dating back to the, the Akaka Bill. I don't want to get into the weeds. That, this issue has beginning to shift that and, and it's beginning to draw a line in the sand between the impact of a negative decision on the TNT between the, the majority of the people of Hawaii and Hawaiians. Uh, that, I think, is a really onerous, uh, kind of a heavy cloud that bothers me a lot. So somehow we have to come to some sort of re resolution on this. But the issues go on and on. So uh, probably the biggest issue for me, and I think the the place where, where the buck has to stop is where we're at, and that is, in my uh, opinion, the total lack of leadership from state government, where the true responsibility to the, to the Native Hawaiian trust, the fact that we are a state is based on the fact that, that on the Hawaiian uh, uh, presence in the Admissions Act, um, uh, I think uh, the, the state and, and the government is really failing us big time on this, with really poor leadership and the, the, the total lack of any predictability about where, where we're going. Thank you, thank you. Kalapo, what, what are your uh, opening thoughts on this? Well, I, I think um, I'm just gonna back it up and, and share with the audience uh, how I uh, come to my relationship with the mountain. As you know, uh, I have had uh, Extreme and rare privilege to serve as captain and navigator on board the Hawaiian East Sea Voyaging Canoes, Hokulea, Hawaii Loa, and Hokualakai. Uh, I'm a student of history. I'm a graduate of the University of Hawaii at Kapa'ulo Kailipalani College of Hawaiian Language, and I hold a master's degree in education at this college. For years, I've worked with students and educators 
sharing the uh, really powerful story of, of our mariner ancestors and oceanic navigators who settled these islands. In 2007, along with four other Hawaiian men, I was granted the rank of four and inducted into a society of non instrument master navigators in the Sarawali tradition and extended the privilege to teach and pass on the skills and techniques and values of the oceanic wayfinder. So my relationship with Mauna Kea is grounded in the many occasions that this special mountain has led me back to my home and to my family as a navigator aboard Hawaii's voyaging canoes. On one occasion, uh, on a particular occasion, on the evening of February 26th, in the year 2000, 21 days after leaving Tahiti, a crew of 15 women and men sailing on board hopefully arrived off Hawaii Island. As the island loomed large in the foreground, a colleague and I were in conversation. On the horizon, the slopes of Mauna Kea rose out of the sea. Its summit silhouetted by a fabric of stars is circled, circled overhead. The conversation quieted as we stared toward that immense sight. As we looked west, the wind gently pulling us along. I stared at the mantis that unfolded before me. Star field circling overhead and arcing toward Mauna Kea, welcoming the night sky. On this cloudless night at sea, peering with my crewmates at the awesome sight of Mauna Kea, the stars reached down out of the sky and touched the landscape of the mountain. And you recognize that they are the same, Mauna Kea and the sky. In that moment, I realized that Mauna Kea and the universe were one, and that Mauna Kea was truly a portal into the universe. Mauna Kea is a celestial window into the universe. Since that moment, I have been an advocate for astronomy in Hawaii. My realization that astronomy needs to be an integral part of Hawaii's community is steeped in the tradition of the oceanic explorers who discovered these islands. By sailing away from the safety of distant shores, they discovered the stars. The wayfinding techniques used on deep sea canoes rely upon traditional methods of observing the stars sensitizing one's body to the motion of the sea and observing all the natural clues that surround you. Seafaring is but one of the many examples that illustrate our ancestors' wisdom to adapt and use their knowledge and resources to survive and manifest their body of knowledge into the culture we know today. As explorers, Hawaiians utilize island resources to sustain their com communities. The slopes of Mauna Kea contain a record of how the generation a very adaptive and intelligent people utilized the mountain as a vital resource. They excavated the thin air slopes of Mauna Kea for high quality durable stones, produced the best set of Neolithic tools in the Pacific. The Mauna Kea Ads Quarry, the largest in the world, offers conclusive evidence that the ancients recognized the importance of Mauna Kea's rich resources and its ability to serve its community by producing the tools to sustain, to sustain daily life. They ventured to Mauna Kea. We shaped the environment by quarrying rock, left behind evidence of the work, and took materials off the mountain to serve their communities with the full consent and in the presence of their God. Using the resources of Mauna Kea as a tool to serve and benefit the community through astronomy is consistent with the example of the ad quarry. To value astronomy and its work on Mauna Kea, we have to value the importance of PK, yeah, knowledge, and its quest for greater understanding of the universe we live in. Our ancestors were no different. They sought knowledge from their environment, including the stars, to guide them and to give them a greater understanding of the universe that surrounded them. The science of astronomy helps us to advance human knowledge to the benefit of the community. It teaches us where we have come from and where we are going. Its impact has been positive, introducing the young to the process of modern exploration and discovery, a process consistent with past traditional practices. My perspective of Mauna Kea is based on, tradition, on the tradition of oceanic explorers from whom I descend. As a Hawaiian, I recognize that I am I'm a descendant of some of the best naked eye astronomers the world has, has known. It is totally consistent to advocate for Hawaiian participation in a field of science that continues to enable that tradition and the field in which we ought to lead. I firmly believe that the highest level of desecration Rest in the actions that remove the opportunity and choices from the kind of future our youth can own. At times, the knowledge revealed from astronomical discoveries is frightening, of galaxies colliding in black holes, assuming all that comes close to them. However, the fearfulness 
of these discoveries should be viewed with an islander's perspective by recognizing our remoteness and vulnerability. As islanders, we are isolated, surrounded by sea on all our horizons, and only an ocean of storage overhead as a companion. But through careful stewardship and willingness to adapt and learn, we continue to survive. I recognize that our planet is part of the greater natural cycle of the larger universe, and there is little that we can do to influence the future set amid a dynamic universe. The ultimate job of humanity must be to ensure that our planet lives a full and full life. It is not science fiction to recognize that our future lies in the darkness of space, somewhere among the stars that gave us light. Astronomy must provide the answers to where our future will be and the challenges we will have to overcome to arrive there. In order for humanity to survive, we will have to travel light years, but each of us only have a lifetime to contribute to the effort. When it is completed, the 30 meter telescope on Mauna Kea will, with greater accuracy and speed, vastly increase the capacity for the kind of scientific research that is vital to the quest for mankind's future. The search for valuable knowledge on the summit of Mauna Kea is a spiritual mission that takes place on a special mountain and is consistent with the work of our ancestral forebears and is done to benefit to the benefit of tomorrow's generation here in Hawaii and across the globe. Mauna Kea, like life, is secured and special. And we need to proceed with the important work of ensuring our future. Let's all look to Mauna Kea and continue the synergy of mountain exploration and start. Thank you. Thank you, Kalapa. If anybody's watching the beginning of this, they are going to get the whole deal right there. They're going to know <laughs> what Kalapa thinks. And I want to jump right into kind of the central question on this one. And I'll start with you, Kimo, is because you've mentioned that you know many of the cultural practitioners involved in this yes. particular movement. Is Mauna Kea sacred? It is sacred to, to many people, but that's different from saying that in some absolute term that it's sacred. Uh, it, it, for, for just in terms of context, we can look at Mount Kea II, which was the Hawaii Supreme Court case that sent the issue of TMT and the development of Mount Kea back down to the Board of Land and Natural Resources. And there was a 44-day hearing held by Judge Ricky Mayamano that took in the evidence from uh, every witness that was prepared to and willing to testify. And in that body of evidence, uh, there are a couple key facts that, that stand out for me. And the first is the use of Mauna Kea uh, for religious or cultural practices, which did not occur until the Summit Road was opened in the late 60s. Uh, frankly, uh, the top or summit area of Mauna Kea is so inhospitable, it's above 70% of the Earth's atmosphere. If you are there after the sun goes down, you die. It is as just as a practical matter, not something that can be used casually or even regularly by anyone, including religious or cultural practitioners. There it was and has been some evidence of the use of Mauna Kea on an extraordinarily limited basis. And so I think one of the challenges uh, for us as, as modern Hawaiians and I only say modern, meaning that we live here today, not in the 19th century or 17th century, is to reconcile some people's belief of, of what is sacred, which is, frankly, a cherry-picking of beliefs that support already a point of view or conclusion. It's, 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 frankly, confirmation bias, looking for things to support what I already have decided is either correct or, or proper. And that is the heartbreaking part for me as a Hawaiian. I, I grew up in Hilo, and we would visit Mauna Kea when I was a child. And I, I remember. Heard this, I've heard this numerous times when people live <laughs> play, on the island. Playing in the snow. And uh, there was no uh, practices, use, or uh, even a talk about uh, Mauna Kea from a sacred point of view. Other than, I think we can say that there is sacred in all of the aina that we have. But there are some particular areas that are especially sacred. And Mauna Kea would not be on the top of that list. I mean, just as an example, you can point to the, the sacred uh, spring of Apokeho, 
in Waikiki, mm -hmm. which is surrounded by the Royal Hawaiian Shopping Center. Of all the architectural monuments of Waikiki, that is probably the most ugly. If you had to just look at what is essentially a parking lot. Oh, in terms, fat, but, 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 okay, I got, I got in terms of what the architecture is, but how it, it, it intrudes and interferes and, and sort of corrupts the area mm -hmm. that was uh, sacred uh, for Hawaiians and was the seat of power in Oahu. If we were going to pick on something, if we were going to say something is desecrating an area that's particularly sacred to Hawaiians, it would have to be something other than the summit of Mauna Kea. And we can have dozens. And uh, a Pokeho and, and Waikiki, that area of Waikiki is just one example. I mean, I, I definitely want to come back to that because Waikiki is owned almost entirely by the elite trusts. So it seems that there's been some sort of transition in the understanding of what is or is not. Is that almost all owned by elite trusts, but there are significant elite trust holdings in Waikiki, no. whether it's Kamehameha Schools or the Queens Foundation that supports right. Queens Hospital and Lily Oakland mm -hmm. Trust. Well, oh, Peter, I, just, I want to give you a chance to respond to this. We're going to call it for two. Is, is, is Mauna Kea sacred? However you take that, you know, where you go with it. Well, l let me just say this. The, you know, in my work as a cultural consultant uh, at the Peter Paul Company, some of the things that we got involved in was responding to that question. Whenever a claim was being made uh, and a project was brought to a halt uh, because of claim of some, some kind of cultural injury, and there is a system uh, that is uh, under federal and state law that you use to determine whether a claim uh, of cultural injury is, is validated. None of those, uh, none of that, uh, the, the three principles are through archaeology, anthropology, through uh, the chants, it has to appear in the chant, the tradition or the custom or whatever the claim is, uh, the tradition or custom that's, that's being violated it has to have occurred a number of times, you know, it has to have a, a system of frequency, uh, et cetera. And none of those, uh, 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 those criteria you know, can be met. As I understand the broad overarching claim of Mauna Avakea, that is, the mountain is sacred. Mauna Avakea refers to all mountain. And the first time that Mauna Avakea is even mentioned anywhere is in, uh, was in 1819, that late, the late, uh, the early 1800s. And it did refer at the time, it was part of a birth chant for Kea Keo. I forget the name of the Ali'i. But anything previous to that, there was no mention. So the claim of Mauna Avakea itself cannot be validated. Uh, there's another thing that bothers me, which is some, some of the claimants uh, that are involved are really devotees of Pele. Well, Pele is not related to Mauna Kea. Mauna Kea is the, the goddess Poliahu. That is her jurisdiction. So there's kind of a crossing of the lines there of jurisdiction, you know, even using the ancient, uh, ancient uh, uh, rulings of the... And then lastly, it, it's unfortunate that today there is no center of gravity to, to adjudicate uh, claims of cultural injury. Uh, the priesthood, which was a, a, a religious slash political body in, in ancient times, would be the ones to advise the LEE, the royalty, on whether a claim was good or not, or, you know, guide them. And so the, the, the priesthood was dissolved uh, with the Battle of, of uh, Kuomo when, when the religion itself was kind of wiped out as an official act of the kingdom. So the business of not being able to validate the claim, uh, not even close, uh, really bothers me that, that uh, we're not hearing from the scholars on this. The silence actually is deafening. Uh, if you're really interested in preserving the dignity of our culture and our people, we ought to be able to, to demonstrate that we are living our culture as demonstrated and as lived over centuries, uh, that all of it seems to be going out the window and we're starting to make up stuff. Lapo, what, is, what are your thoughts on this question? Is, is Mount Achaia sacred? Well, I can, I can show you my, my own personal perspective and this is my opinion, right? I don't, I don't speak for any other Hawaiian except, except myself. Um, on the matter of Mount Achaia being Sacred. I don't characterize Mauna Kea as being sacred. Um, I do uh, use the word spiritual to de define my personal relationship with the mountain. Um, and that's because of, of, of the definition of the word sacred and the premise of it. The word sacred, as defined, speaks about, uh, uh, it's about the worship of God or God. 
is about a religious relationship. And the word spiritual is about a relationship to place. It's about a relationship to environment. It's about a, a reverence for serenity. It's about a respect for, for nature. So, and, and the, 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 the reason why I base it uh, that I don't characterize monarchy as sacred is that because of the abolishment of the kapu system in 1819, historically, our elite uh, uh, abolished the religious order that governed the daily lives of all Hawaiians in 1819. Um, and so I'm going to respect that. I'm not going to act contrary to the will and the wisdom of uh, of our esteemed Ali by resurrecting and abolish religion. And let's be real clear, yeah, they abolished the religious order. They didn't cherry pick and say, only these gods, they, they completely abolished the whole religious order of which, of which the apex of the Hawaiian religious worship was human sacrifice. So I am not gonna disrespect the, the will and the wisdom of our esteemed Ali by acting contrary. Uh, to their will and wisdom. I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna recognize that. So that's why I too call Mauna Kea a spiritual environment and not a, a, a sacred environment. Sam, you know, the, 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 the thought that Kalepa triggers for me is, it's one thing to say uh, why it is not sacred, uh, the, uh, uh, which is fine, and, I, I, and his take is, is very good. But the sacredness, if you want to invoke sacredness, what is sacred about Mauna Kea is the opportunity for the search for knowledge. There is no denying that one of the fundamental principles and, 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 and the, the, the dignity of Hawaiian culture and, and, and its history was the search for knowledge, was the constant you know, paying attention to how things worked, how the universe worked. I mean, I mean, look at the accomplishments in the search for knowledge, what it accomplished. Uh, Polynesians, Hawaiians being the, the last of the, de the development series, having uh, without compass, without sextant, without stern post rudder, without keel, were able to, to settle one third of the Earth's surface through navigation over a moving environment. That is all based on the search for knowledge and the rise of, of the cultural, of the curiosity. Mauna Kea is, is uh, brings us down in history as one of the greatest opportunities, not just for Hawaiians, but for mankind, in order to reach out. And the relationship of, of, the, of the 30 meter telescope that will allow us to go back in time jibes with the Hawaiian story of creation, which is the night of Po, going back to the darkness. That, that this instrument will allow us to trace our ancestry down through the heavens all the way back. There is nothing more sacred than that. So the mountain, to me, is sacred because of its opportunity to continue the search for knowledge, you know, in, in, with our pride and the dignity of our people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah go. I, I just want to correct Peter. Thank you, Peter. Yes. But it's not one third of the uh, Earth's surface, it's actually two thirds. Oh, two thirds. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Good thing we got that out of the way. Um, Kimo, I wanted, I, Mention, bring something back that you mentioned specifically, which was the cherry picking. And I, that was a very interesting term. I think it speaks a little bit to what Kalepa is raising about the religion having been abolished. Can you speak to what, what you mean by that exactly and what parts you see of being cherry picked and what parts being left behind? Why well, I think Kalepa mentioned uh, how the um, kapu system was overthrown by Hawaiians themselves. And it was initiated by the Ali, but the uh, high priest of uh, Hawaii, Heva Heva, participated enthusiastically in the destruction of his own temples. And they threw off what they viewed at that time was the burdens and the shackles of a uh, belief system that governed everything you do from the moment you awoke into your dreams and had aspects of that religion that included things that we would now today not accept by anyone or any religion, such as human sacrifice such as the use of sorcery to pray people to death. And to the extent that you are accepting uh, some aspects of uh, a cultural belief, like the reverence for the aina 
uh, the, the thought that the, uh, the mountain is the residence of the gods uh, ig ignores all of the other aspects of the religion, which today could not, could not be sustained. There would be, uh, as I sit here, I don't believe that any Hawaiian today would endorse the uh, uh, practice of human sacrifice. When Kamehameha, and this is something that Kalepa mentioned, when Kamehameha was, was aged and, and, be, and he became ill, he was advised by his kahuna that, to, he, uh, that they should sacrifice 40 uh, uh, people to help him recover from his, from his illness. And so that, that was part of that belief system. Um, yeah, Kalepo, uh, I remember mentioning, saying, oh, that left all the buckeye, not a running for the hills. They're not going to right, hang out. Which was also part of around. it, too. I mean, there's a real practical aspect to our people. But let's be honest. That is not why the, the concept or even the word sacred is being used today. The word sacred is being used by those that oppose the TMT to stop the conversation. If you have a claim of sacred, there is no opportunity for accommodation, for understanding, or compromise. It's an absolute line drawn in the sand. That allows people to ignore the fact that the TMT is not going to be on the summit, which is arguably the most important place culturally of the mountain. It will not block the view of the sun as it rises or sets, which is important. It is off into a plateau 500 feet below where most of the most sacred or um, important cultural practices occurred. So the cherry picking that I was referring to was meaning that not only were we cherry picking amongst all of the aspects of couple which were overthrown, and only looking at, at, the, at really the, the one or two percent of, uh, of an entire belief system when we're talking about uh, the uh, realm of the gods on the mountain, but also cherry picking in just what was factually occurring on the mountain and how the TMT is not interfering with any of those. If you look at the history of 10 years of litigation, what you see is a series of accommodations for yep. things like environmental uh, uh, questions, for things like cultural practices, with things like view plane, on and on and on. And once all of those questions were answered, the permit, after 10 years, had to be accepted because it had met all the criteria. Now that people who are against the telescope have lost every legal avenue, they have resorted to what they have left, I think, or what they believe they have left, which is an emotional appeal, a traditional or historic um, uh, 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 denial of Hawaiian rights and cultural practices, so the old grievances, and the use of sacred so that there can't be any further discussion because that was already resolved by the courts. Right. Yeah. Hey, can I just uh, uh, chime in? I just want to uh, sure. emphasize what uh, uh, people said about Hava Hava being, being uh, a promoter for the abolishment of, of the religion. It's a side note that, that he had the He's vested interest in overthrowing the, the couple system because that was his authority, and they gave him the uh, the, the monica to to enforce. And so, why you would never see that uh, it was time for the uh, abolishment of the religion? That's the most curious, uh, one of the most curious aspects about uh, individuals who chose to uh, abolish the religion. So, yeah, that's a that's a good point, uh, Kima. Thank you. Oh, you know, following, following up on uh, uh, what Kim was talking about, sacred, from a public policy perspective, it's important to understand what, what Kimo said, which is when you say sacred, uh, you're talking about no discussion, no discussion. All right. In all other matters that involve any violations of law that have to do with protecting historic sites, with tradition, with customs, with et cetera, there are processes that you use. And the processes involve investigation, processes involve dialogue, processes involve uh, some kind of a navigation. Here, they've raised the bar by using the word sacred because then it shuts off all dialogue. Now, for the, for the, I don't understand why the leaders who are trying to resolve this don't understand what that means because they've been spending months 
uh, coming up with solutions. Uh, Mayor Kim with uh, his package of you know, cutting a deal, of, uh, of, of creating conditions or trying to accommodate. And I guess it's not ringing true in their ear that sacred means no discussion. So the message that I'm getting from this very clear, very upfront, I mean, let's say it, they've been very upfront about this. We are not moving unless you tell us that the TMT is dead. Now, what is it that we don't understand about that? Meanwhile, and we're going to get into this later, the impact of this on the community uh, that goes beyond just, just the TMT issue you know, is very serious. I absolutely want to get into that. I, I wanted to mention something on, on, that you had brought up before, Peter, which was um, there's, there's a personal nature to the religious claims. And I've heard this multiple times, and I'm wondering if you can expand on it at all, about this concept of family claim, where the, the and, and I don't fully understand this, which is why I'm curious, is the idea that every family on Big Island or in Hawaii, in, in ancient, pre -con, meaning pre-contact Hawaii, or even maybe shortly at, thereafter, had different family practices. How, do, how, does that, how does that work? Well, this is kind of a gray area. I'm not an expert in it, but I, I know that, uh, uh, first of all, the Hawaiian gods were, were part human. You know, it was, they, they were like, it's like the Greek, Greek mythology, right? The gods were part human. And so you could argue with them. You could actually you know, disagree with the gods. In the case of the, uh, the Aumakua, that is the family gods, Family gods were established, but if they were not working, you got rid of it, and you created a new god, you know? Well, so I, I'm not quite sure how that fits in here, but it, it, it kind of reduces the, uh, you know, I think the leverage that you're able to use in invoking, uh, you know, the, the belief system of one or two gods, because you can change it if it ain't working for your society. Uh, Sam, maybe I can respond to that. Sure, sure. Everyone has a right to their own religious beliefs. Yes. And I have a complete respect for anybody who has a belief in uh, the mountain being sacred, but I don't think that that right for that belief and their personal belief to then impose obstacles or controls over other people who have equal and important rights as well. The challenge we have with the mountain is a relatively small group is imposing their view of sacred or religious upon everyone else, including an international consortium developing a telescope, including a hundred potential Hawaiian scholars every year who will be denied a portion of a million dollar fund for 10 years for, for education and astronomy. If it were up to me, every scientist on the mountain would be Hawaiian. Every Hawaiian that we lift up lifts up a family. A hundred scholars a year lifts up a hundred families. Over ten years, that's a hundred scholars and their families lifted up. That ends, that kind of creates a tide that is lifting the boats. My my friends and I and, and to this day uh, I call them my friends, even though some of them don't call me a friend anymore. Or on the other side, for me, it's not personal. I respect that their beliefs, but they will then deny a future for hundreds of Hawaiian families. They provide nothing in return. Now, I would feel completely different if they had a mechanism to provide a million dollars of scholarship funds every year for the next 10 years. I'm cool. But it is not fair for my personal religious belief to deny another Hawaiian family an opportunity for excellence. If it were up to me, there would be an equal fund for Harvard Law School, Columbia Med School, and every other professional opportunity for excellence. We were a community known for its excellence. No one even came close in everything we did, and whether it's feathers or astronomy. In Polynesia, the Hawaiians developed it to its epitome, with one exception. The Maoris were better carvers. But other than that... <laughs> There's a, that you, you hit right on another topic I wanted to discuss, and you might have said everything you wanted to say about it, but what, what does this claim of sacredness mean to the concept of separation of church and state in our society? And, and I, I, I want to give a little bit of context here at the danger of speaking too much, but people often, I've heard say, oh, you know, separation of church and state is a Western concept, and, I, and therefore I don't want to talk about it or something like that. 
And I've never understood that argument because it's like, I don't care where it comes from. You know, you, know, you can get the yoga from India or wherever you're going to get it from or feng shui from, you know, East Asia. And it's just be like, that's a great idea. I want to integrate that into my life. The idea of separating church from the political power of the state to me always seems like a great idea no matter where it came from. And you feel the same way, and this is for uh, all three of you, or, and to the extent you do, how do you think that this claim of sacredness fits into that? Well, I, I think you are showing your bias because there is an enormous uh, proportion of the world that disagrees with you, that believes that the, uh, it is, is not only a good thing, countries. but is, it, you are compelled to combine religious as well as political and governmental administration. Uh, and then you have uh, Iran. You have the Taliban. You, you, if you want to look at the most repressive societies on earth, you look at those that, believe, uh, that base their government and political systems on absolute beliefs, religious beliefs, you will find the most oppressive governments that there are. Now, some people will argue that's a good thing. Uh, obviously, I, I would not. Yeah, where, you, you where would, would you, not. What and, would you and, think? Of and, that? And, and, and I would not, but I, I don't think I have to. I don't have to take that position because all you have to do is look around and say, is that what we wanted? And I know that's what Hawaiians did not want because they lived, couple was way more restrictive than even the most conservative form of Islam today. And Hawaiians threw off the yoke of couple on their own, and Heva Heva was the most enthusiastic leader of the uh, uh, dis uh, complete uh, dissolving of couple. Overly enthusiastic, I think you even said before. Yes. The destruction of the I, actual it, To such an extent that all of uh, the artifacts that would be illuminating for us today were destroyed. But like Kalepa, I don't feel that it's my position to judge what they did at that time for their purposes. What they did, they thought was best at the time. Uh, what I object is that some of my friends are imposing what they think is best on everyone else, including denying opportunities for Hawaiians. Peter Kalapa, if you want to expand, or? Yeah, well, it, I mean, the, the separation of church and state is a constitutional-based uh, uh, right, uh, you know, right. So I agree with Timo. Everyone is entitled to their belief system, whether the rest of the country believes it or not. But we do live under the Constitution, which says your belief system is yours. Have it, practice it, as long as it doesn't interfere with the rights of the other citizens. So that's where you run into a kind of a problem. With and I'm curious on the on the. Do you agree with that? That agree. Con, do, you, do you agree with that constitutional principle? Because one of the things. That's oh, absolutely. Most fun. You know, the, the United States is unique. It's one of the few countries that was not was was established and its constitution, recognizing the rights of, regardless of race, color, gender, or sex. There is no other country in the world that I think, that I know of, that has that as a founding principle of the nation, right? Australia. Australia does, yeah. Okay. Well, we had our own problems. <laughs> yeah. <with something. laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Australia had their own problems. democracies in the world. So, well, I mean, it's just Australia had a lot of indigenous rights issues. Yes. And Hawaii, yeah. you know, the United States had slavery, obviously, where we could vote. I mean, it was, that was a whole other aspect of Hawaiian history also, where, you know, women were separated from the political power, right? That was another part of the conversation. There is a valid criticism that the belief systems of the West, and the reason why many natives are so skeptical of this uh, separation of church and state, is that if we look at every instance where the West has contacted native peoples, we have had a horrific experience, whether you're aboriginals in Australia, or the Maori in New Zealand, or the Hawaiians in Hawaii, or the Native Americans throughout the entire continental US and, and Alaska as well. So for, you, you can completely understand the emotional, the, the sort of centered in your gut reaction of Native Hawaiians on issues where they feel that they have been wrong. The, the, the appeal to the protest is very emotional. And, and that's not a rational argument. We could sit here all that's day right. talking that's to right. each other about how do you accommodate the various views, which is what happened for 11 years throughout the whole hearing process for the permit. But at the end of the day, it, it didn't turn out to be now 
a matter of accommodation because the current plan accommodates every single objection that was raised. Now it's just a matter of winning. So now we're getting to some of the, some of the other areas, you know, uh, of this, which, which is separation of church and state. The government needs to do its job, and I agree. You know, the issue is more than TMT now, and I hopefully we're going to get into that in a little bit. This is really about sovereignty. It's about self-determination of Hawaii. It's about a hundred years of, of, of violating so much of our culture of basically, you know, ripping off all the land. So that emotion, I agree with Kimo, it's powerful, really powerful. That's what we're kind of seeing. TMT happens to be the match that lit the fire. I mean, I think we'll get a lot into the other more issues on, on the second part of this whole discussion. One thing I wanted to discuss on the separation of church and state question is a lot of the protesters have said that they believe their constitutional rights are being violated because they have the freedom of religion. They have the freedom to exercise religion. Do you right. see that? <coughs> I understand the Supreme Court has said that's not what's happening. There's, you there's see no that violation way? of that. They are free to exercise their anywhere on the mountain. They just can't stop other people from accessing the mountain. You know, there is a process, both in federal and state law, that protects the sacred sites. There's huge documentation of most of it. You can take new applications in through the management system that, that they have. If you have something sacred you would like to do on the mountain, there's no one that's preventing anyone. But when, you, when the claim of sacredness uh, uh, declares that every square foot of the mountain is sacred and nobody's allowed to do anything without their permission, now you got a problem with separation of church and state. Right. And there's a, there was a other question we got from the audience, because we've done this panel once before, and we had a, at the state capitol, hopefully we get a chance to do it again sometime soon. But there was a number of questions we got from the audience, and one of them that was interesting to me from a sacred perspective and a historical perspective was, in terms of Hawaiian spirituality and individuality, was the kapu system brought to Hawaii by others like priest Paul? Oh, yes. Uh, well, it was a different and sort of enhanced version of Kapu that was much stricter. Can you, can you explain that a little? I can, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing the majority of the audience on the internet does not know that little bit of history. Do you know a little bit about that? You can explain uh, it? A, a little bit. I mean, the high priest Paul brought a, a stricter Kapu system. He brought a, a, a essentially breeding scheme for Ali and how you might maintain mana by making sure that the relationships were as close as possible. And they brought the practices of human sacrifice which did not be, which was not a part of, of Kapu before his arrival. His direct descendant and real expert, and I, I don't claim to be the real expert, and I just know this sort of superficially, is um, um, Kahu Momi Lum, uh, who is the Kahu for the Heo Hokohola, which is Kamehameha's Luokini. Uh, and she explains how. Uh, the TMT and the development of Mount Kea is not offensive to Hawaiian beliefs. And this is a direct descendant of the most strict uh, form of couple. Uh, we could really get lost, I think, though, in the forest for the trees by trying to argue about the fine points of which priests brought what version of couple, and at what point in time did we practice couple and to what extent. What we have no disagreement on is that. The Hawaiians overthrew Kapu. It was not through foreign influence in 1819. And that the current imposition of a, a relatively narrow set of beliefs, it cannot prevent other people, Hawaiians or, or not. I just want to say for Hawaiians, cannot prevent other Hawaiians from exercising their beliefs to explore the stars. We were the first adopters whether it's firearms or telephones in Ilani Palace. There is, uh, Kalep is a navigator, so he can speak to the opportunities that Hawaiians would have had if they had uh, modern uh, scientific instruments. Uh, maybe we can ask him, Kalep, is there anything offensive about the use of modern scientific instruments from a Hawaiian cultural point of view? No, because uh, uh, Kamehameha granted uh, Captain Cook and Captain Vancouver uh, through the authority of the of the of the priesthood at the uh, Heiau, the right to uh, to uh, erect their uh, temporary observatories there. So, what does that say? That says that uh, 
Hawaiian people's point of view that, that culture and science could exist. And from the perspective of, of, of the priesthood, they absolutely felt that it was not offensive for, for, for science and its instrumentation to be, uh, uh, to be erected right on the, uh, right on the Heia ground. And quite frankly, when Kalani Opu returned from Maui, because uh, he was fighting on Maui when Captain Cook arrived in Kalani Kobe, the first place they went to visit was the, was the uh, temporary observatory next to Ikeau Heia, and they were amazed at the, uh, at the astronomy instrument. They were especially amazed at the quadrant that the, uh, that the, uh, Captain Cook and his men had set up on the, on the, on the Heia ground. And this was at a time when kapu was still the law of the land. So to claim that it is somehow offensive or inconsistent with Hawaiian beliefs is, is just not supported. What would you say to the descendants of those who were lost the battle of Kuomo? Because those, there's actually, I mean, I think you practice under Winona Beamer. I think the yes. Beamer family actually traces their descendants right. based on a, an article I was reading about it that was very interesting about the battle. It's where I learned about it. Actually. That's where I learned about it. That's <laughs> was fascinating. And I'm just curious, and he actually was debating, uh, or, or he was on television discussing, or, or one of the Beamer members, or the Beamer family was on television discussing with Makana Silva, a native Hawaiian astrophysics student that's supporting TMT. I went to Mount Akea with him. So the, the, there seems to be some tie in there to that family. I mean, what is, what is they, if they're, they're, I don't know what they're exactly claiming, if anything, but what is that, does that tie into this? How does that play into all of this? And, I can't speak for, for the, the descendants of Keo and Manono uh, and the Beamer family, but it is something of a trap to try to go down every single rat hole that is proposed as being important, uh, because not all of it, it is. There are several baskets of importance. Some are very important to people personally. Some issues are very important to some people in terms of their family. And some issues are very important to a community. And then we have a larger community. The governor is responsible for the entire state. The university is entire, it, it responsible for its university system. Uh, there is, a, a, frankly, an absence of leadership, both on the state side and the university side, in terms of clarity. There is no clarity of the message that PMT uh, is one, it's been now established by legal process as a project that is entitled to proceed. And two, what is the benefits? And, and let's be transparent. And what are the deficits, if any, of the project? But there is no conversation at all from that side, whether it's leadership from the state government or the university, that responds in any meaningful way to a generalized protest. And it's very sympathetic to see natives say that they have been harmed. And, but if that's all you know, at that superficial level, then uh, the, the real core issues get missed. Sam, Sam. Kalapa. There are, there are episodes in the history of, of humanity when, when uh, uh, there are dramatic shifts in, in, in the direction of a culture. The Battle of Kuomo was one of the incidents when there was a dramatic shift, right? whether they're going to retain the practice of the traditional religion or whether they're going to, they're going to uh, abolish it and break away and choose a new direction. Uh, uh, yeah, so that's what happened in the Battle of Kumo. But you got to ask yourself a question, right? Yeah, Kiku Okalani and Manono was defeated at, 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 uh, at Kumo. But why didn't the, uh, uh, the, the population who supported that uh, the couple system what, why didn't they, they continue to keep on rising up and, 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 and battling for the, uh, uh, the continued practice of the, about, of, of, of the couple system? That's because the people, all the people supported the abolishment of the, of, the, of the system. They were ready for that dramatic shift in their culture. So it was just time. And it's too bad that the two Kalani could not accept it. And, and he, he greatly underestimated. Uh, the firepower that Leo Leo, uh, through his general uh, Kalani Moku, had available to them. I would have never gone into a battle uh, carrying musket spears. Uh, it was a battle that was won by musket. Yep. 
You know, so interesting about uh, what your question is. Uh, in spite of the Battle of Como and the, the general acceptance of Christianity, right? missionaries arrived about a year after the right. Battle of Como. Uh, in spite of the fact that the Hawaiians basically, all, most of them became Christian, but many of them never <coughs> gave, totally gave up some of the old, yeah. what you would co consider to be spiritual or religious practices. And it's been interesting to me down through the years to see like pastors of Kalaiho Church actually kind of walk a line between the two. Um, I don't think there was any harm, but, but this is a feeling of still staying connected to your past and your culture in some way uh, that wasn't offensive or didn't hurt other people. And so, you know, bridging those two is really kind of fascinating to watch all that play well, out. Yeah? But you can only do that, Peter, if you don't claim those cultural beliefs to be sacred. Yeah, you, I agree. Once you yes. brand them as sacred, yes. then they yes. uh, have a, a different meaning, which is a, a bright line. I can say, like Pilahi, Haki mm -hmm. did, that aloha means akahai, to be humble. Uh, Lukahi, to work together. Olu olu, to be pleasing or pleasant. Ha ha ha. And uh, ahunui. We can have all of these uh, cultural values, but if I want to. Well, yeah. point to a sacredness, then all of a sudden I've, I've are, turned into something else. I, I, I agree with what you're saying uh, in terms of behavior system. But, but, but then you have practices like calling a Christian kahu, who is Hawaiian, to go bless a place because ghosts are running around. You know, that's still practice today. And there is a belief system in that. Uh, um, so it's those kinds of practices that I think is kind of, kind of, I don't know. I, I like the fact that they're able to walk that line, but it can't hurt other people. No question. The difference is, is when you engage in those cultural practices, you are not denying anybody else. Right. Yeah. right. And that's can what I the Hawaiians are particularly good at. Can, can I just point out, uh, Sam, yeah. that when, when the, when the kapu system was abolished and the Hawaiian populace was instructed to, 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 uh, to burn their personal gods or to hide them away, Hawaiians are very, very respectful. Yeah, they were going to depart for the ancient tradition, but they just didn't throw their gods in the, in the fire. A lot of them took them into caves and, and created pipe pies or, or, or uh, platforms where they could re-erect them. And they, 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 uh, they walked away from the religion, but they, they, they left those ancient gods with, with care and respect. And they were very, very, uh, uh, very, very clear uh, avenues of, uh, of respect and reverence. As they as they turned their backs on the on the Eastern religion, so yeah, it was a good departure. It's one of the things I'm wondering is, do you think there's a risk? And it, it touches on the sacredness, but it expands a little bit more. Do you think there's a risk, you know, especially from your legal background, that the more you push for the sacredness stamp on cultural practices, the higher the risk is that the United States Supreme Court is going to come down and say. This whole Hawaii Constitution, where you are respecting gathering rights and Hawaiian specific practices and DHHL and OHA, that's just crossing the line. You now have this, they, they take a relook at the race space, they take a look at you know, all of these things that are specific to Hawaiians <coughs> that are really based on a lot of this cultural practice kind of angle. When you start bringing the sacred and making political demands on it, do you think that heightens that risk? We would need more time. I think to, to explore that that's a that question that that is a that is too complicated I think to give a, a superficial or servile answer. Yeah. I I can say this um, with the current administration in, in Washington D.C. and the appointment of a hundred and eighty plus very conservative uh, judges, it would not surprise me that Native uh, rights in Hawaii and elsewhere, uh, would, would be under, under threat. Because from the point of view of people from the mainland, they see any uh, program or preference or accommodation for Native rights as race-based. What they don't see is that if there is a political uh, uh, basis for it, particularly in Hawaii, which is the whole reason for the Kaka Bill. And so that's why this is so complicated to understand in a meaningful way your question, I'd have to ask all of the questions that lead to what's the distinction between race-based or political entity. 
which allows programs to serve Native Americans on the mainland because they're recognized as separate political entities and not a quote-unquote race. And then the whole idea of race is so complicated. I mean, there's no biological, scientific basis for race. It's, it's a concept that was imported from the West. I cannot say race in Hawaiian. There's no word for it. So um, that might be best served in another context, I think. So there's a whole history, you know, as he, uh, Kimo mentions, the Native, Native, Native Americans. There's a whole history of law, federal law, that protects traditional and customary. This is not sacred, but it's traditional customary practices uh, that has been extended, even though Hawaiians are not recognized as Native Hawaiians, they've extended some of those rights uh, to, uh, to the Hawaiian community that, and, you know, like the right to gather. And, um, a lot of that has to do with the on undeveloped land. Uh, 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 halau, uh, hula halau, is has a right to cross undeveloped land to access mountains to gather flowers for you know whatever the ceremony is. So those traditional and customary practices that you think have been in place, but it is a very very difficult, very fine line that you walk when you separate out that or or try to take one of those practices and put the claim of sacred on it. Now you're talking about a whole different. We're, we're at one hour, so we're going to take a little break, and we're going to come back, I think, expand on a lot of other topics that we can touch on in the time we have available. But uh, Kalepa, starting with you, I just want to give, give you a chance for some closing thoughts on the question of defining sacred. Yeah, again, uh, again you know, like, I would just reiterate that, 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 you know, it's up to Hawaiians what they want to call it. They call it sacred. I choose not to. I choose to to uh, define Mauna Kea as a, as a deeply spiritual environment. And my relationship is with the place, not with any religious practice. It is with, the, uh, uh, it is with my reverence for the serenity and the natural beauty of this special environment. Thank you. For myself, um, I, I feel a kinship to the people who protest EMT uh, because for 10 years they fought the fight it, to use every legal uh, avenue and all process that they were due to establish whether or not the TMT complied with all criteria and requirements. They used that system to make sure that there was a strict adherence to every single regulation that could be applied. It is tragic now that even, it's only because they lost, ultimately, in Mauna Kea too, and the uh, 44 days of hearings held by Judge Rickey, that they now deny that there's no a need to follow the decision that they asked for, that they demanded, that they uh, felt was required under the law. Now, if everyone who lost the case could ignore it uh, and, and then just do what they want, then we would not be able to uh, have any of the benefits that serve our people today. Our real challenges are not the telescope. It's health, housing, and an abhorrent level of incarceration of our people, none of which we can address if we have no other effort than to stop things from happening like the telescope. Peter? Well, my closing thought is that, you know, I, if, if if the KIA and the protectors can validate their claim, validate the claim uh, based on evidence, uh, you know, like any other claim, I, then I would, I would absolutely retract, you know, how I feel about it and say, okay, you validated the claim, then you go from there. But uh, right now, there's nothing to validate what they're saying. So I'm stuck there. All right, thank you very much. For now, we're going to take a little break and we'll be right back with our panelists. Aloha.